Welcome to another edition of the Wolfpacker Podcast, MC Squared version, coming at you this uh, Sunday afternoon, um, the day after a uh, an NC State eyes, at least an infamous game in Chapel Hill against the Tar Hill. So we're going to reflect on that a little bit and talk some big picture as well. But before we do that, let's get some um, uh, reminders out of the way here. First of all, you can listen to this podcast wherever you get your podcast, Spotify, Apple, wherever, please, um, wherever you choose to download your podcast, be sure to follow us and, and rate us, give us a review, leave some comments. I said last time, if you got anything negative to say, direct it at the other guy and not me. So target Matt Coe on those. Um <laughs> Also, it was uh, subscribing to the YouTube channel, We're almost up to 2,000, which is great. So uh, please um, subscribe and follow our YouTube channel at uh, youtube.com slash the Wolfpacker. Or you can watch this podcast if you want. We've got a pretty sweet overlay and to uh, see both of them. Um, you get to see Matt Coe's handsome face and my gray and beard. Um, also, be sure to subscribe to the website. For twenty nine ninety nine, you get all the way through August thirty first. That's about getting like five months free or something like that. But listen, the deals are not get they're getting less and less sweeter. They were real sweet at the beginning. Now they're getting a little less sweeter. So um, time's gonna come where the deals just don't come that often. So be sure to take advantage of that. We well last yesterday had a ton of information from Junior Day at NC State football. So. Um, and I posted an update after the game a little bit on Traquavion Smith, which proved to be true. He could have probably gone to bed a little bit, breathing a little bit easier on Traquavion Smith. So there's some of the benefits of being a subscriber. Last but not least, one of our great supporters at the Wolfpacker is RogueShop.com. They are a uh, husband and wife small business that uh, produces natural cannabis products. They're legal products that can really help you with your anxiety or if you're dealing with chronic pain or you have sleep deprivation. Um, these are products that uh, are dear to the owners of this company. The husband is a disabled veteran. Uh, that's how he found out about these products and he uses them himself. Um, you can go to, it's a small company, you can go to their website. They have real live people there to chat with you at rogueshop.com. They're also on our message board. There's a thread pinned to the top of a wool den premium board where they've uh, been interacting with subscribers about their products. So please, please, please give them a check out as well. So I hit my target three minutes or less. I got that all out of the way. Uh, a couple of elephants in the room, right? NC State loses to North Carolina, 80 to 69. They're the competitive game. Um, State jumped out to 20 to 12 lead. Carolina got back into the game, got to the free throw line. Again and again and again. Uh, one point Carolina lead at halftime. It was still about a one point game. And then UNC, I think, went on an 8 0 run. And that kind of gave them the cushion. And NC State could never quite get that stop and get a little run of their own going to get back into the game. But during that point, I think Carolina was just taking a 10 point lead. Uh, went to Quavion Smith, took his hard fall, ended up being taken off the court on an EMS stretcher. Good news is, best possible news for NC State. A lot of that was extremely precautionary. Release from the hospital, x-rays were negative. From all accounts, he's going to be fine. He would definitely be back day to day. He may even be back for Notre Dame on Tuesday. So, um, I got my thoughts on it, but I'm going to, as the host, I'm going to defer to the guest Matt Coe, you watched it from home. I was at the <clears throat> Um Your thoughts on that play, just that play. Well, then we'll branch out to the other elephant in the room, which was the officiating and the free throw difference in this game. But on the on the file on to Quavion Smith, your thoughts on that play? So it was a – I know a lot of fans want me to say it was just a downright dirty play. I feel like – there was no real ill intent. I th- Leaky Black did mention after the game that, you know, he hopes Turquavion's okay and, and whatnot. So I'm not going to sit here and say it was just straight up dirty. Um, but with that being said, when you've had an entire game where 
one side gets to be as physical as they want, that type of play happens where you're you're letting a team play how they want and the other team is handcuffed. You're only allowing it. You're enabling that type of play. So I hate that it happened to T. Uh, it was a really scary sight from from my end, just you know, sitting at home. So I can't I can't even imagine what it was being in that stadium. Um, I also want to address. I don't think that Carolina fans were booing uh, T getting hurt. I just want to throw that out there. But they were 100% booing the fact that their player just who just sent our guy on a stretcher is now not going to play in the game. Um, so that was a little classless for my liking, a little tasteless. But um, I'm going to try my best to bite my tongue uh, on, on some stuff today. Hey, but I, I know that like this, this is felt throughout the NC State community that like la- last night was just it was a mess. Like I don't, I don't know how else to put it without you know going on a tangent. But I'm glad he's okay uh, because without T, I still think that we're a, a good team, but we're definitely not going to reach our ceiling. So to have him possibly be back for that Notre Dame game is is massive. Yeah, I first of all, I I don't know Licky Black personally. Uh, but I do know people who do know him personally. This is a guy that Kevin Keith wanted on his NC State roster, so I know people who have dealt with him, and they all say the same thing. It would be totally out of character for him to take a dirty, cheap shot. And I do – from seeing the replays, I think the way I viewed it is simply put, to Quavion beat him um, on the dribble. Leaky made a misjudgment that maybe he could recover and block the shot. His misjudgment was a bit of a rec- – turned it into a reckless defensive play, not intentionally, not maliciously. He just made a poor judgment. Um, yeah, I think on Twitter, I've seen one screenshot Carolina fans keep going over and over with about, oh, he touched the ball. I don't think – I think that's just uh, – that's just the um, angle, if you will, of the picture yeah. that makes it look like he touched the ball. We have camera shots from others. We've seen still photos. He never touched the basketball. He made an attempt. I think he made an honest attempt, but a poorly judged attempt on the basketball. Intent's not the issue. That's what people I, – I, I think some people need to remember. It's not the issue of the intent. It's what happens is the issue. Mm-hmm. And what happened was he, he smacked Quavion Smith across the front of the face and forced him to the ground in a very hard way. Mm-hmm. And what happened? That's a flagrant foul. Now, you can argue flagrant yeah. one versus flagrant two, but when you have a guy who potentially happened to be taken out on a stretcher, the definition of a flagrant two includes – Something I, I don't know the I had the exact word, and but it's something about excess leading to potential injury, an excessive foul leading to a potential injury. So you then get into the area. Okay, this may be elevated to flagrant two. Yeah. Um. So uh, you know, but you've got to get rid of this. I, I've seen a lot of UNC fans saying it wasn't intentional. Nobody's saying it was intentional. Nobody's saying it was a dirty play. It was a flagrant play. That's a big difference, and it made a difference in the game. I can't, you can't deny that. I mean, you yeah. took out the most explosive score for NC State in a game where they're down 10 points. That makes a difference. I mean, that makes yeah. a difference. And, and then after the game, I don't know if you've seen the picture, but there's a picture of Turquoy Dunn going around how he's out and about, I guess, in Chapel. I don't really know where he's at, but he's around and people. It, there's one and, photo of him on Glenwood and Raleigh. Somebody, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't verify that that was actually taken last night, but I mean, you can right. say so let's let's assume that it was taken last night then um i i find it really hilarious that it's a weird way for carolina fans to say hey i'm glad you're okay you know they're they're out here bragging that he's you know he can't go in the game but he's out doing whatever like i think you're kind of missing the point here Tar Heel fans like he's he's safe he's okay i feel like that's kind of the the message of this whole thing so it's a weird way to you know spin zone that one uh yeah. trying to dunk on us for our guy not potentially breaking his neck so i don't know i guess thumbs up for you guys yeah i will tell you all right they did not boo to quavy on me they were very respectful when he was on the floor that new arena was very respectful you could hear a pen drop when the team gathered around smith they did boo the flagrant two call on Ricky black and i think part of that is on the fault of the uh, people at the dean dome who ran one replay of a very 
of an angle that did not show what happened very well. Um, and they should have never done that. I mean, that, that, that was poor taste on the arena's part. Um, but they showed the original angle, like the angle you're watching when the play unfolds, right? Mm -hmm. Where you can really see yep. what happened. It, it, the overhead, it, the, under the basket, it, the behind the basket, it, the other end, you know, the baseline shots are the ones where you get a clear angle of what happened. So uh, I thought that was a poor decision on the part of UNC to replay just that one replay, even to replay it at all. Wait, you're telling me UNC did something to make it look like they didn't do anything wrong and that's it? They just showed it? one replay. They just showed <laughs> the one replay. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think in the, in the fan, and it was not widespread, but when I have to be fair, I was there. It was like a more like a, uh, a I would say maybe a quarter of the fan booed. Uh, it sounded pretty loud on the TV. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, no, in the arena, I was kind of like, I think there were some people booing, and then there was a reaction from the other fans, because it was quickly stopped. I think mm -hmm. there was a reaction from other fans, like, what are, what are you doing? Um, but uh, uh, to your point, yeah, I mean, if Tequ the whole reason he went out on a stretch was because Tequavion's neck hurt. If you see pictures, yep. you know why. He got a good little whiplash from being smacked across the face and by standard medical procedure in ACC games um, they had to take him off on a stretcher because his neck hurt and he also yeah. uh, which we later found out he would complain of tingling and numbness in his mm -hmm. arm and so you have a guy who has a sore neck and some tingling and numbness in his arm you're going to take every precaution. you think to Quavion Smith was milking it <laughs> they leave the game on a stretcher and go to the hospital right um, Wants to win that. That's the one game he probably wants to win more than any other on the schedule. You, you think that's in, his intent is to milk it and go off on a stretcher with a towel over his head? I mean, come on, let's use some common sense there. So, of course, yeah. he, if he's a college kid, he feels good. He, he survived the scare. And, and what we understood was he was feeling better after a, a, some time at the hospital and the x rays were negative. He wants to go out and be with friends. Yeah. Sure. sure. I would have done it. You would have done it. Yeah. Everybody else would have done it. So let's move on. Now the free throws at the other elephant in the room. So I, I will set up some facts because I think that might have played a role in this. Carolina leads the ACC by a enormous margin in free throws taken this year. Um, so they have a reputation for getting fouls as part of their offense. Um, Hubert Davis admitted as much after the game. NC State is an aggressive physical defense. They lead the ACC and send them opponents to the free throw line. Um, that's part of their reputation. That's just part of the nature of what Kevin Keats wants to do defensively, which is be very aggressive on the on the on the ball defense, trying to get steals, trying to get deflections, forcing you to have as little time as possible to set up your offense. Um, the byproduct of that is two things. One, you get fouled, and second is you can give up some easy shots with ladies to higher field goal percentage allowed. Um, I think that kind of played into play last night. I think the reputation of both teams played into play. I never think the official deliberately go into a game with a plan of, all right, we got to call this one for UNC. Screw NC State. But I think this was one of those games where officials went in thinking, uh, you know, NC State likes to foul. You know, Carolina good at getting foul calls. And it was without the benefit of seeing it a second time, full disclosure, just basing it on live. I felt like it was called much tighter, which is fine. If you're going to call it tight, that's fine. I don't like it that way, but that's fine. Just call it tight both ways. And uh, my buddy Matt Cole sent me a nice text comparing to – Post up plays. Um, one where Dewana was called for a foul on Baycott, and the other where Nance was not called for a foul on Burns, and you could not tell a single difference between the way the two plays were defended. And I think that's where the frustration lies. The numbers are incredible. If you go to the quick hits column, the numbers in terms of fouls called on NC State. Foul caught on UNC, 
He was one of the fewest amount of fouls called by an, on an opponent against NC State this year. It was the most fouls NC State has ever committed in a game this year. It was the biggest free throw differential in a game this year by a long shot. I mean, there was just a lot of like <clears throat> craziness on the difference. Yep. And so you had a chance to rewatch a half. Um, mm -hmm. and so your take on the officiating and the free throw difference. Look, I completely agree. I don't think that the refs have it out for NC State. And I think that a lot of NC State fans were trying to voice this. But I know in my personal experience, trying to discuss this game with a UNC fan is damn near impossible. <laughs> um, the, not not the one that sent him to a stretcher, but the other play where Terquavion caught a forearm to the head. Uh, I'm sitting here discussing it with Carolina fans, and they're telling me right, straight to my face. Uh, that it's not a foul. And I just – you can't argue with these people when it comes to this. I mean, I I couldn't help but but feel as if, yes, I do think that we were fouling a good bit. I'm, I'm not here to argue that. I understand that Carolina gets to the free throw line a lot, and we foul a lot. That's great. But you're missing the meat of it all. You're missing the context of it all. I mean, I'm watching identical plays on one end and the other, and one side's getting the call and one side's not. You're letting plays on Carolina side be as physical as they want. Nothing's being called. Um, at home, in 10 home games, Carolina is averaging plus 13 free throw attempt margin. But on the road, Carolina is averaging only just plus 2.6. That's a staggering difference. That's not like a like a minuscule. That is that is a game changer. That is a game changer from top to bottom. Care, uh, NC State had, uh, between Terquavion and Jarkel, I, I count up nine um, opportunities in the paint, whether that be driving or, or, or jump shots, just shots inside the paint. We had 13 in the first half. Only one of those was called a foul, and that was DJ Burns. It was an and one. I, I just – I don't know what you, what you guys want from us. You know, you tell us to play physical. All right, we go down there and play physical. We didn't settle for three-point shots, right? They actually took one less three than UNC did. Exactly. Game. We took we took less threes. We were banging inside. How is it that we completely flipped our game to go inside, had more attempts inside, and this lopsided free throw attempt margin is it, just it's it's amazing that it's like arguing with a brick wall. Like I can't I can't help you see it if you're a Carolina fan. That that was a clear cut and dry. Hey, this is getting called on this end, and this is not getting called on that end. And I'm just wasting my breath trying to argue this with Carolina fans because they're never going to see it. I mean, it's so hilarious because you got all these Carolina fans um, up and down Twitter saying, you know, don't foul. Don't, just don't foul. Just don't foul. Stop fouling us. Telling somebody to go to Chapel Hill and don't foul us is like telling somebody who's a homeowner to not get robbed or telling a billionaire, hey, guys that, that are poor like just don't be poor all right it just doesn't work like that you you can't just simply go into chapel hill and not get the and not get the foul calls like it just doesn't work like that um there's a lot of times where terquavion on the drive was getting there's a play in particular where he caught a rebound was going across half court and seth trimble literally hugged him and nothing was called um it, it's just it was really frustrating i'm not saying that we didn't foul them i'm not saying that there was, you know, there's only like a handful of calls where I'm just like, I don't even know what, I, what, we're, what we're looking at right now. But uh, what I am saying is that one side got to play as physical as they wanted and the other side didn't. Um, that was glaring obvious. And if you can't see that, then I just I can't help you. I, I don't I don't know what you want from me. Um, so yeah. I get it. They bang down low. They're great. They get to the, the free throw line a lot. Uh, but if you honestly sit down and watch that game, I mean, say say this out loud. One team shot thirty nine free throws and the other one shot 12. And if that doesn't just make you laugh or just raise your eyebrows, what are we doing here? Yeah, I think that, I mean, that, I think Debbie Al, former AD for NC State, said there should never be a game where – and it, the free throws is one thing. There are two things that have to be added. One, NC State was not fouling at the end of the game. So it's not like there was an excessive free throw shooting – toward the end of the game to kind of, because mm -hmm. what's going to happen? They can expand that margin as you try to stay in the game. 
it's the, the, the overall foul total is what they I mean, I, if I go back here, NC State would call for 27 fouls. 27, yeah. The previous high in a game was 22 against Kansas. Um, and then. And that was back in early November. I yeah. mean, we're going on months. Yeah. 16 fouls called against North Carolina was the, tied for the fifth fewest in 20 games this year. One of those fouls for UNC, by the way, if you want to talk about it, I believe NC State fouled once in the last minute for free throws, if I'm right. You might correct me if I'm wrong. Did they foul once or twice? I remember once at the end of the I game. think it was just once. I yeah. think it was just once because by then it was – the door was already open. Like, we didn't really have a shot to get back into it. Remember, Carolina fouled on purpose too at the end of the first half because they were not yet in the bonus. So they were trying mm-hmm. to prevent entry state. So the on purpose fouls actually balance out and cut each other. And an 11 different free throw, uh, and an, a difference of an 11 fouls called in a game this year. Um, the previous widest difference with the Miami game and Coral Gables, when Miami was called for 11 fouls, which was the fewest any opponent had fouled NC State, and NC State was called for 18, which is still nine less than what yeah. they had in Chapel Hill. And that difference was seven. So by four fouls, this was the widest difference in the number of fouls called. And it goes back to what you're talking about. NC State, they, they, they're going to call the 27 fouls on NC State. You cannot tell me that Carolina's defense is that spectacular. This is the Carolina defense, by the way, that ranks in the bottom third of the ACC in block shots, um, three-point field goal percentage defense, scoring defense, field goal percentage defense. There's no reputation for being a great defensive team. Yeah. And so it, it, it's, that's where it kind of would get back to the argument of nobody's arguing. If you're going to call the fouls on NC State, picky tack as they may be in some cases, that's fine. It just has to be consistent. Yeah. Both ends of the court. And you cannot honestly say that one team, that they're both basically running the same game plan. Armando mm-hmm. Pickett got 13 shots. DJ Bones got 13 shots. They both went eight for 13, by the way, from the field in this game. NC State shot uh, 17 threes. North Carolina shot 18 threes. They basically ran the same game plan offensively. In fact, they both had the same amount of assists, too. Not a, not a lot for either team. There wasn't a whole lot of, uh, you know, passing it around the court. It was a lot yeah. of one-on-one stuff. So I think uh, State had seven and Carolina had eight, or maybe it was the other way around. It was like they both had almost identical number of assists. So you can't tell me that Carolina was just that more effective playing defense, moving their feet. It was just hard to see. And it played a and what frustrates NC State fans. I don't want to make this sound like it was blaming the loss on the officials because we're going to talk about something else that was not the official fault that did hurt NC State quite a bit. Um, but it played a role in the game. I, when you win a game by 11 points in a game that was a one point game with about 15 minutes left before Carolina went on a little run, they went on 8 0 1, four points were at the free throw line, by the way. Um, that a plus 27 point differential from the free throw line didn't play a role. All right, was it 27? No, 23. I'm sorry, 23. Credit to UNC, by the way. They made their free throws. They yep. set a school record for a high free throw percentage when attempting more than 30 free throws. So they, look, they get not their fault that the refs are calling fouls the way they're doing it, by the way. So you can't blame North Carolina. They just took advantage of the situation that they got, and they made that free. <clears throat> so, um, and honestly, I don't even think either team really played well. I don't think either team played excellent. I think if we're gonna if we're gonna jump off of the free throw problem for a second, um, we didn't rebound the ball well. Uh, going into this game, mm-hmm. going into this game, I'm almost positive that we were number one in the ACC in offensive rebounds, and we only had three in this game we got out rebound 11 to three on the offensive board so i get it like we don't have our top two rebounders that's that's fine but we've been rebounding the ball well we've actually been playing some of our best basketball in the last four or five games so um 
I don't even think we played well, and we were still within one point practically the entire game. It wasn't really until Turquavion went down and the air got sucked out of the building. That was when things kind of turned for the worse. And that includes DJ Burns getting two fouls in a minute and six seconds to start the second half. Um, so we were in this game. It's not like this. And that's another thing that's so funny about this because, you know, you've got all these Carolina fans talking about the overall record and, and last 50 games and all this. And it's just so funny how proud they are of this win. Um, and, and quite frankly, I feel like NC State outplayed them in every single facet. Um, except for rebounding and, and free throws. Yep. And I, the, I thought this was the first game NC State missed Jack Clark and Dusan Mahorsik. Um, mm-hmm. Because um, it's an interesting stat. When Carolina going into this game, they were 13 and 6. In their 13 win, they were a plus 7.5 on rebound margin. In their six losses, they were minus 0. 0.5. Um, and Yesterday at Saturday at the Dean Dome, they were plus 15 on rebound margin. And you mentioned, yeah, NC State played four games without Clark and Mahorsik, and, and they've been 4 0. But you kind of got to look at those teams, right? Duke, awesome rebounding team, huge front court. You would think that would be a problem. But what we realize is Duke's backcourt is not within the stratosphere of NC State's backcourt, and that's more important. And so that was actually a good matchup for NC State. They didn't need a Mahorsik and a Clark because their guards absolutely just controlled that game from start to finish over Duke's guards. Um, and you look at Virginia Tech, not a particularly tall team, not a very athletic, I mean, much is athletic, um, but he's 6'7", right? And Basile, Grant Basile, the transfer from Wright State, more of a stretch center type guy. And they were without Hunter Couture. They were shorthanded as well. Um, and quite frankly, they're just not having a lot of luck right now in basketball. Look at Miami. They really only play one guy that was 6'7 or taller in their lineup. It's a short team. You look at Georgia Tech. A, they're not a good team. And B, they really only play one guy that's six seven or taller. So they kind of had a series of matchups where you can get by without. I thought this was the first game where you look at it like, you probably needed Jack Clark and Dusan Mahorsik in this game yeah. because Carolina yeah. did dominate the glass. I feel like also in – I saw this swirling around Twitter when, when I was re-watching it. I felt like that first three to five minutes, NC State kind of came out a little antsy, a little frantic, just kind of all over the place, not really getting into a rhythm. And, and then once they kind of slowed down um, – I, I don't know. I, I found myself like towards the middle of the game, like, man, we're really not shooting the ball a whole lot. This is weird to see. Um, I agree with you on, on the Jack Clark and, and do some horses thing. And hopefully we can get those guys back soon. But um, I will say I wouldn't panic for any reason. I, I think Carolina kind of needed this game more than NC state. Um, NC state really didn't need this game other than like ragged rights. Uh, Carolina is a few losses away from being on the bubble. So, I mean, their best wins, honest to God, I think their best win right now is – I wouldn't even say Ohio State. I think Ohio State is slipping really hard. I don't – I think Ohio State is very overrated. Uh, they got a couple okay wins. Uh, you beat NC State, that's considered a good win. It was a quad one. Um, yeah, but I don't think anymore. it's panic mode. Well, not yeah. anymore, but I'm just saying, like, it, I think if we can continue, continue this stretch that we're putting together, it will be at the end of the season. We'll have to see, obviously, but um, – yeah. I don't know. I just I, – I wouldn't panic or anything. It just – it's against the epitome, the whole thing of what it means to play against Carolina in Chapel Hill, um, down to the how the fans acted, how the plays were uh, – the calls were. Um, we really didn't even play all that bad. I, I don't think we played great. I don't think we played up to our standards. I thought Leaky Black had a really great game defensively on Jack Clark. I mean, not excuse me, not Jack Clark, uh, Jarkel Joyner. Um, or I was actually impressed with Ernest Ross. He put together some good minutes too. Uh, I don't know. I, I'd have to go re- back and rewatch it again, but I really just don't think that NC State played all that bad. Yeah, I, kinda, I thought they were two evenly matched teams. I just think that um, 
the difference in terms of on the play, on the court stuff, the difference was they have Armando Baycott and and she they doesn't have an Armando Baycott. And what I mean by that is a guy that can get you that you feel confident will get you twelve rebounds a game. Well, I'll be, I mean, hell, I mean, DJ Burns was was giving Armando Baycott hell. They had to switch off. They, I mean, they he did. couldn't do anything with it. And, and Kevin Keith did acknowledge it. The difference is that both got 18. All right, mm-hmm. Both went 8 of 13. Burns mm-hmm. had 18. Baycott had 23. Difference largely being um, um, Baycott got to the free throw line more than Burns did. Um but Burns, I mean, Burns is, a, is, is an average rebounder, and Baycott is an elite rebounder. And that's what the difference is between the two. And and yeah. you just, the guy is, look, NC State fans can feel about UNC all they want, but you can't. You do have to acknowledge they have a rich, rich tradition in basketball, and the guy was still probably. 15 games left to go this season is already the career rebounding leader in the history of that program. That's, that says, I mean, that says, that says quite a bit. And that was the difference in this game. I felt like NC State would get it down to six, they would get it down to seven. And there were a number of times where UNC stopped any kind of momentum with NC State, not on the first shot. But on the offensive rebound and a putback, I remember Baycott had a couple. Caleb Love had one where he, um, I mean, he may have gotten fouled on his putback. I can't remember exactly. Yeah. So, um, Thirteen to four, second chance points differential yeah. in favor of Carolina. Yeah, Carolina actually made left field goals in NC State. They shot um, poor than NC State. Right. I um, mean, if if we want to take a lazy approach to this right let's just close our eyes and say this out loud one team shot better from the field better from the three-point line better from the free throw line was within a couple numbers a couple spots for basically leading every category except for two major ones rebounding and free throw and you lose by double digits that just doesn't add up that just doesn't make any kind of sense at all i i just i need people to just kind of understand that um but like I said, I, I would I, – here's another thing. I don't think any NC State fan actually had us going into Chapel Hill and winning that game. So it's it's hard to get upset about this loss, um, especially if we're already thinking that we're not going to win. <laughs> I'm just at that – I'm just kind of at that point as a as a fan all my life going into Chapel Hill and seeing this the same joke being told over and over again. Like it's not funny anymore. It's just – I don't – it's just – it's so hard to be – invested when we go to chapel hill now um because we're, we're dealing with this i mean there's a there's a moment in the game where they had called so many fouls on us that the graphic under our, our team name mm-hmm. went blank they didn't even have a foul chart they didn't have a bonus they just went completely blank i thought like what am i watching right now um but the, way, there was the one riley point. game is going to be interesting yeah it was one point where it was eight to one foul difference on the second half and you could tell the official called, I think, two or three really cheap fouls on UNC really quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was almost like somebody got a memo. Because that was only coming after the first half when I believe the difference was like 11 to 6 or something ridiculous mm-hmm. like that. And at that point, it was like 19 to 7. And I think somebody was like, you know what, this is they we're getting close to having triple the amount of fouls on one team than the other. Yeah. Um, Doubling is bad enough. It's probably inexcusable because it just that yeah. game don't go that way. It just don't. It's go just it, it, it's really frustrating. Better than the other, and then when you get to the point where you're tripling, and then you got to yeah. and then they call it a few cheap fouls. Um, it's just really frustrating to like sit here and have to have this argument because like that that is a factual statement. You can't talk about this game without talking about the free throw differential. That that is that is what won the game, right? There's some stuff that we could have done better, sure, but that is what won the game. You get 36 points from the free throw line. If you get 36 points inside the paint, that, that's a great day. That's a phenomenal day. You got 36 points from the free throw line. I mean, you played Alabama in four overtimes and only put up 20 free throws, right? And I understand, like, maybe it's a different approach to a game, different strategy, whatever. But this game went to four overtimes 
and you couldn't even get within just at half, half of, of what you, you shot in a regular game. Um, I, I don't, like I said, I don't want to make this all about free throws, but it's really difficult not to. Uh, I, I think they got a good shot to win in Raleigh. I will say that. Um, I, I, I can confidently say that I don't, I don't feel like Carolina is a better team than us right now. Even, I mean, think about it. We had two starters out. We had a player get <laughs> stre- carried off in a stretcher. Um, and it took 39 free throws to yeah. ultimately come away with the win. Yeah. yeah. And you're not going to get that. I mean, I, you're Carolina and I'm, you know, we're not a North Carolina podcast, but the fact is that Caleb Love is just not playing well right now. He didn't play well against NC State. No. Uh, you know, maybe RJ Davis would have shot well. He, he certainly banked in a lucky three there at one point. Um, mm-hmm. But he you know, kind of made it. Get, I think I forget how many points he got. But I think he only attempted eight shots and ended up with like 24 points or something like that. Um, Almost. He had eight shots, had 26 points, 14 for 14 from the free throw line. Yeah. And so that would kind of um, – yeah. The bottom line is that Carolina is not a good three-point shooting team right now. And yep. so, yeah, they're going to have to rely on Baycott being on the floor. They're going to have to rely on rebound, and they're going to have to rely on – that's part of their offense. Yeah. I mean, they just, that is part of their offense. They, they severely yeah. miss Puff Johnson in this game. That was, that was one thing that I noticed, that they really, really miss Puff Johnson. And if it wasn't for Leaky Black being such a good defender – there might have been a bigger uh, a bigger discrepancy from NC State fans because I, I really think that he did a good job of locking down Jarkel. Jarkel just never really got into his rhythm. Um, really didn't go past very many people at all. Um, yeah. Relied on that mid range jumper, which I think is a great shot for him. That is definitely his shot. Whenever he's on a cold spell, that's his go to shot. He finds that spot and just a little stop and pop right there, and and that's that's his shot. And but. Other than that, I just – I don't feel like the game ever came to him. Got really hard there, too, when he became the focal point after Smith. I mean, at that point, yeah, you just lost one of your two explosive scores. I mean, yeah. you know, at that point, all the focal point goes on Joyner. Um, I got real hard. I mean, Burns is a good scorer, but he's not an explosive scorer, right? It's a very methodical yeah. approach to his going. I thought he played well, by the way. DJ Burns, I thought played well, and it was big to get the one – I think people forget NC State jumped out to a 20 to 12 lead in this game. I think that's right around when the bank three and a few free throws uh, came up. And um, it was, uh, it was, we were on a 15 to two run. And that was when the LJ Thomas just, that was one of those calls that just was random out of nowhere where he went to go for the ball. And I think he was on RJ Davis, but got around the screen, was reaching for the ball, didn't even touch Davis. And, you know, there goes the whistle. Um, just yeah. fitting. Yeah. And then I think State had a sloppy turnover where maybe Tequavion fell down and it led to a breakaway for Leakey yeah. during that stretch. So it wasn't like UNC went on a gigantic run. Uh, no, this this game was always in reach. It was never at any point until the very end where it was just like, all right, we lost. You know, it, this, game, this game was 100% very much winnable for NC State. Um, real quick, kind of big picture. Entry Tech got Notre Dame. Uh, last trip for Mike Bray to PNC Arena. I hate to see that because he's one of the, the – seemed to be one of the better guys in the ACC. I, I really thought Notre Dame would – you were kind of worried about that. But then first game Notre Dame played against Boston College at home, they ended up losing by double digits. Yeah. Post-Mike Bray retirement. So something seemed to be going on with that team. Um yeah, they way too good to be one and eight or whatever they are in the ACC. Yeah, so. I, I think NIL and transfer portal has a lot to do with that. I mean, we're seeing a lot of ACC coaches kind of just quickly exit, and um, that's just my my guess. Um, I always liked Mike Bray. I always loved his, you know, mid early two thousand teams that were sleepers, and uh, they've always been a, a. I've always been a fan of theirs. They're always my sleeper. I was big on them last year. And, so I don't know. I, I always like Notre Dame basketball. Yeah, they haven't honestly. They haven't been relying on transfers that much on the current. I think it, no. I think it's just more so the idea of yeah. 
this switching of how college basketball is now. It's not so recruit focused. And I don't know. I just don't think coaches really want to deal with the the headache of all the NIL and transfers and recruits. Right. And, uh, you're talking about Coach K, Roy Williams, Jay Wright, uh, Mike yeah. Gray. Yeah, I'm missing some guys, but you know, how much longer do you think uh, uh, Tom Izzo and uh, Jim, Jim Beheim seem to want to hang on forever? But how, how much longer do you think of Tom Izzo? And, I mean, a lot of the big stars of college basketball coaching um, are definitely – Bowing out, but I do think this is an important game for NC State because you can't. These are the games you can't drop. You mentioned how the Carolina loss, it, you know, doesn't really hurt NC State a whole lot. I do think what it does do is it, you win that game all of a sudden, your margin for error really jumps up dramatically, and so now you have yeah. to get back. You got to win. I mean, the first, just went, taking care of business is the mode right now. Beat Notre Dame, Florida State, Georgia Tech, Wake Forest, Clemson, and North Carolina at home. Basically, if you went out at home, NC State is in the NCAA tournament. And so that's where we talk about taking care of business. But a win at North Carolina or a win at Wake Forest next Saturday, all of a sudden, your margin for error really increases. Now you can slip up once, maybe twice. Yeah. I, I, that's, that's I think that this I think that this Florida State game is going to be an interesting one. They're starting to get healthier. They got Bob and Miller back. Um, I'm never going to doubt Leonard Hamilton and his coaching ability. Like they're they're getting there, right? It's going to take a, a a big mountain to climb for them to get back into this thing. But I I look at Florida State as a trap game. I looked ahead after this after this Carolina game. Uh, our schedule. I mean, two wake home against Florida State. I think is going to be tough. I know NC State with uh, Kevin Keats' struggle with Georgia Tech. You got to go at Virginia. Um, I know that we said that January was the the big month, but man, February. These are those can't miss opportunities, like you said. But I'm I'm circling that that Florida State game. I, I feel like that's a trap right. game. But I said I, I said I, I knew that was going to happen with Florida State. They were so terrible in non conference that they, they're in a position where they can only get to the tournament by winning an ACC tournament. But yeah. um, they were better. They were just so severely sort of handed in non-conference play. Mm-hmm. And so they look terrible. Their resume looks terrible, but now they're getting full strength and they went at Pittsburgh. They're five and four in the ACC, which is probably a better representation of who they are. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Hopefully that could probably be like a quad two game at home. If yep. Florida State had been full strength all year, right now it's still quad four. And to your point, I mean, I, for Pittsburgh, that's a huge mm-hmm. loss that they yeah. suffered at home. To and it's not a bad FSU team, but it's going to look like a bad loss because of where Florida State stands in the stand. And by the way, we do talk about margin for error. Duke down to twenty nine in the net. So they can only slip one more spot or NC State is losing that quad one game. And um a lot of people are wondering why NC State fell so much after losing to UNC in the net. It's just a reminder. It's not necessarily all about what you do. It's about what your opponents do. And Dayton had a bad loss. Uh, a lot of those teams toward the bottom of the schedule are really falling quickly with the alarm and Want to want to throw this out too? Butler is dealing with a lot of injuries. Manny Bates has not played since January tenth. Um, yeah, that, that one gonna isn't going to be there. that could slip to quad three status. Uh, yeah. Been, uh, unfortunately, Vanderbilt has picked it up and they have climbed up to quad two, and they they got a win at Georgia. I think they're now uh, actually ahead of Butler in the net rankings. Um. But you really need Butler to stop the bleeding, which is going to be very hard when you look at that schedule. Uh, you need Furman. No more slip-ups from Furman. Matt Coach team over there, Furman. Yeah. Um, they got a big matchup tonight against Wofford. It should be an interesting game. Yeah. Um, cause you, but what has hurt, though, the Austin Pease and the Williams and Mays and the Coppin State, you know, they were kind of 225, 250. Now they might all yeah. be below 300. And you yeah. teams are teams are kind of meddling out right now. I will say with this upcoming Wake game, I I don't know if I like our chances at Wake. I, I'm I'm a I'm a fan of Steve Forbes. I like the way he runs his program. Uh, 
I will say how we felt after um, that Miami game going into this Carolina game. Um, if you were to win at Wake, I feel like you're right back to where you were before this Carolina game. After, you know? Yeah, you might even be ahead. Hopes are down. Yeah, you might even be ahead. I mean, because hopes are down. Uh, the air kind of feels sucked out of the arena right now. Um, you don't want to lose like that, but you did. But if you can go not slip up against our name and, and win at Wake – that's uh, that's that's another great resume builder. I mean, I feel like I feel like NC State is definitely a tournament team. It's just where now. I mean, because they could be anywhere between a four seed all the way to a twelve seed, and there's a lot of room for error right now. Yep. So we'll have to see. Well, back at it. I wonder if they do something for Mike Bray. That'd be a good thing to do. We've done a lot for the. I NC hope so. State. Hopefully, a little kind note for Mike Bray. Today, yeah. I'll be at post road game since and I announcing his retirement. But um, anyway, that'll do it for this podcast with uh, Matt Co. Just a, a quick reminder again please check out our sponsor, rogueshop.com, uh, for your natural cannabis needs, whether it's you know sleep deprivation, anxiety, or chronic pain. Um, they have a live chat feature with a real life person there to answer your questions, and they got a lot of great products that could help you out also. Uh, be sure to uh, rate and review this podcast wherever you may listen to your podcast. We're available on all your various podcast um, sources. And also, please subscribe to us on the uh, YouTube channel and Facebook, by the way. We got Facebook page. It's all easy to remember. Just hit the Wolfpacker after all of that stuff. YouTube.com slash the Wolfpacker. Twitter.com slash the Wolfpacker. Facebook.com slash the Wolfpacker. Also, underscore Matt Cove at Twitter if you want to follow him. Um, and so that'll do it. We're back at it Tuesday night, Notre Dame, 7 p.m. tip, ACC. Every game like for like the next month is on ACC Network. I don't even know if I need to say it. Just assume it's on <laughs> ACC Network unless I tell you it's not. So thanks for listening.